<laughs> Welcome, Duncan. So good to see you again. Thanks for coming. Thank you. And I was wondering if you could tell me um, how you feel about the ICO um, binge. I mean, it's just all over the place these days. I have to give an annual meeting report to my limited partners. And so usually I talk about unicorns or other mythical <laughs> creatures. This is all ICO because okay. they want to know. So the interest level is very, very high. Okay. And uh, I was talking to Dan Rosen a couple of weeks ago. He said a few firms he knows, um, not their firm, but a few firms were changing their structure so that they could invest in tokens. So it's not um, seen as an enemy uh, towards venture. It's actually holding hands, working together. Is that how it's looking? It's, it's looking like it may be a threat to Series A, okay. which is kind of interesting. Some of the Series A funds and some very interesting, very good, incisive thinkers, Tomas Tonguz is my favorite, okay. have written about this and they're looking at the trend lines. Yes, and so as a threat's probably the wrong word. So we do post seed. Bullpen is after the seed round, we look for companies with trajectory. Four of our portfolio companies at various levels are considering ICOs. Well, our view about it is it's a good thing to do after you have sufficient reality. It's probably a very risky thing to do if it's just a white paper and we're going to build it in two years. And the other thing that concerns me, uh, because as you know, I'm a bit of a venture capital groupie and really like to support the venture capital community you here. Groupies? Me. <laughs> I'm the only You're one. The <laughs> I, I was wondering um, how, because I'm very supportive of the VC community here in uh, Silicon Valley and uh, promote them a lot and, you know, have termed myself a VC groupie because of that. But um, I'm also concerned uh, because I think that the venture capitalists provide an incredible experience and knowledge and it's not just the money from what I gather from all the VCs I know. And uh, I wonder how that's going to affect startups that are just raising ICOs and not having that sort of advisory capacity and that investment in the company like a venture capitalist. Um, obviously, there's bad stories about venture capital, but there's also a lot of good ones. That's a very good question. When you look at the, the two themes I'm going to get to, one is the constipation in the capital markets has led to this being very exciting to people. But the second is, the VCs who are coming in and the best token ICOs appear to be those that have made progress with VCs first and then launch second. The data says about half of the big ICOs have VC backing, and a lot of the small ones don't. So it's like a, it's pruning itself to the better and the worst ICOs. So the VCs are not gonna be pushed out of the system or go away, it's a different value add. The, the, the constipation problem is very real. So we used to have this terrific capital market in the dot-com bubble and before where people got into a company and the company went public relatively quickly. And what people don't recognize is that if you put $10,000 in Amazon in 1997 when it went public at a $400 million market cap, which seems remarkably low today, you'd be worth 7 or $8 million today. So a normal retail investor could get extraordinarily wealthy by playing the field of tech stocks. After the bubble burst, the federal government in its wisdom to protect people basically pushed them out of the market completely. And we destroyed what used to be a terrific ecosystem for small caps, IPOs. We destroyed not just the reality of it, we destroyed all the players, the small investment banks. Recreating that's gonna be very hard. The IPO business has become an insider game. Facebook goes public at a $100 billion value, remember, 400 million was Amazon. So Facebook didn't go public till all the wealth was created by insiders, and then it went public and the retail investor had not a lot of upside after that. Mm -hmm. So I view the ICO as a glorious alternative to the constipation that was legally created after the bubble in the uh -huh. capital markets. That side of it is terrific and wonderful and exciting, but if you look at the chart of Bitcoin, which I think is really reflecting the growth of ICOs right now. It is the steepest bubble since tulip bulbs. It has outdone the dot-com bubble. It just looks bubblicious. It has risen over 10,000 It's so quickly. I was doing a chart for annual meeting and I had a chart in November 15. It was just hit 7,000. What is three weeks later? Two weeks later, 10K. Uh, so th this is clearly an irrational market and that's causing a lot of interest to come in. What happens in that market is the bubble burst and then people come in to sort of take control of it. And like we did after the dot-com bubble, 
we could kill the golden goose that's inside of the Bitcoin ICO world rather than try to leverage it. So I'm actually worried that the irrational nature of the market right now will cause an overreaction the wrong way, just as the dot-com thing did. Well, let's pray that that doesn't happen. I agree yeah. with well, you. Just one on more that. thing. I really do appreciate what you're doing for the ecosystem right now for ICOs. What I'm going to say out there, part of my messaging is, let's do this correctly. Let's try to get the legal rules correct. Yeah. I think eventually it's going to have to go into our wonderful Congress not to figure out a regulatory scheme that fits ICOs without killing them. Because right now, the SEC seems to be on a relentless path to go regulate and slap these things down. And uh, it's probably the wrong place for the regulation to occur. So I'm going to ask you another question. And um, you, know, you can let me know if you want to answer it or not. But um, I'm very fascinated by what's happened in the last six months in the ecosystem um, with all the negative press that um, media, the big media have been launching about um, venture capitalists and also about Uber and Theranos. And so there's quite a lot of negative um, negativity out there and uh, it's affected some of my events in the sense when I pull venture capitalists in, I get t hundreds of people on the streams and hardly anyone wants to come and sit and watch and listen. I am still sitting up the back yeah. re listening avidly. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned about that for our ecosystem and I'm wondering what your overview is that, um, you know, this big media is only destructive and um, is not anyone's friend. I know Robert Scoble, who's a friend of mine, he, he got uh, launched by TechCrunch and Business Insider and no one checked on the facts except San Francisco Chronicle did. And he said, gee, thanks for checking, you know, no one's like checking. And she said, it's a low bar for information these days. So uh, I'm really concerned about that because I think that you guys are you know, a very important part of our ecosystem. And um, so I'm, it's affected me and I wondered what your overview is. Well, first of all, the media has business models been destroyed by the internet. And so it's remarkably sad to me to see how the New York Times or Washington Post put clickbait type headlines out in effort to stay ahead of the trash they get out of the internet, mm -hmm. the internet media side. Mm -hmm. It's just, I was watching Ken Burns' Vietnam documentary and I was shocked and sort of amazed at how good the reporting was. Uh, you know, it got flamed by Nixon and all that, but the reporting was very solid, very real, and it wasn't opinion, it was these are the facts on the ground. And I sort of I missed that. There are reporters still trying to do it, and there's still a great group of uh, terrific people in the news media, but the economics of the system driven by the internet cheapening news has caused the mainstream media to fall. And I, I don't know if there's a way to solve this, but I hope it gets solved. Just yelling about fake news and Russians is not going to solve it. Yeah. So given that as a broader context, it is kind of sad that the, the, the venture community, the tech media, may be caught up in the backlash of it. I have found, however, a lot of the tech um, media, the really good ones, are really good at what they do. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I see real reporting still there, and I'm not, it's, it's really outside this ecosystem people coming in and trying to grab headlines. Now, having said all that, there is a huge need for women to be in our workforce correctly. There's a huge need for more women entrepreneurs and women in venture. Yes. And so some of this correction is probably long overdue. Okay. Like anything, you get an overreaction and you come back to the middle. So my hope is we're going to come back to the middle. That's a really nice way of looking at it. Thank you so much, Duncan, and so looking forward to this panel. Very good. Thank you.